Welcome to Beyond Galileo. My name is Gary Gress. I am in the Department of Geography and Environmental Sustainability, and I'm in the uh, College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences. Also, I, I am privileged to be on the Faculty Advisory Committee here at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. Beyond Galileo uh, is a program involving a series of podcasts that explores subjects and ideas surrounding the current exhibition that is here in our museum at the university, the uh, Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art here in Norman. The exhibit titled Galileo's World, an Artful Observation of the Cosmos, uh, has been here since January 21st and uh, is open to the public. Each podcast that we will have are artful conversations with experts in their fields from the Norman OU campus to find out how their disciplines, including art, science, philosophy, and of course many more, bridge Galileo's world to our own. Today our featured guest is Ed O'Rear. Ed, a longtime faculty member, holds the Francis W. Wynn Professorship in the School of Chemical, Biological, and Materials Engineering. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineers, and he has been recognized with the Regents Award for Superior Research and the Sigma Xi Research Award. In 2013-14, Ed served as chair of the University of Oklahoma Faculty Senate, and he is a former president of the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art Association. Ed, it is, it is really a pleasure having you here today. And, and I think we'll start out with a, uh, a question that is pretty obvious, I think. In conjunction with the University of Oklahoma's 125th anniversary, we launched a series, or the university launched a series of displays around the campus and the state with the theme of Galileo's world. Of course, for you, you know, how do the items in this gallery, how does this exhibit uh, relate to you? Let's, maybe that'd be a great general opener. Well, yes, thank you. And let me offer a welcome to our guests too at the same time. And uh, I first really wanna say just to, to me how wonderful it is for an exhibit that centers around one of the world's greatest scientists to be in an art museum. How wonderful is that uh, in a day where there's so much emphasis on uh, STEM, and, and STEM is obviously very important to me as a faculty member in engineering, but it helps us to really see the importance of art to the sciences and engineering and how they work one against the other to really enrich our lives and to help our economy and in many aspects of our lives. So Galileo's World, uh, welcome again to Galileo's World. This exhibit, I think, tells us or shows to us that Galileo's world, both literally and figuratively, were out of this world. So literally, you know, he of course, uh, we will see in this exhibit or you will see in this exhibit, uh, his images of the moon. And we know that Galileo used this telescope to discover the moons of Jupiter. So literally out of this world, and figuratively too, just in, in how rich his life was and the contributions that he made. Of course, the, the phrase Galileo's world tends to make us think spatially, but I would argue that you could go into this, you, as you walk past the telescope and enter into the first gallery, that you could really think temporally. And to me, this gallery, it's so rich in the Renaissance and the meaning of the Renaissance. Uh, as one walks around this room, you see some indications of uh, the time period, uh, the first few centuries, with a, a book showing Euclid's uh, geometry. And uh, then we know, of course, the wonderful art that was done, the sculpture work of that time period, the Hellenistic uh, art period. And then there was, many people would say, this void, the Dark Ages, and then the Renaissance uh, takes place. So this time period could really be looked at in that sense. And here we have prototypical examples of the Renaissance man in da Leonardo da Vinci, a man who was knowledgeable in the letters and the arts and the sciences. So in, as you walk to the far end of that room, you'll see uh, da Vinci's De la Pintura. So this is about uh, uh, his work as a painter. And da Vinci, of course, uh, very well known as a painter and the artist of, I would say, arguably the best known painting in the world, the Mona Lisa. 
and also uh, a beautiful uh, Madonna Lita, which is in the Hermitage Museum. Uh, I encourage people to look and, and track that down on the internet to see that beautiful painting. And yet, uh, da Vinci also uh, known as an innovator, a scientist, and I would say an engineer. Uh, in da Vinci's time, though, science really had a very different meaning. It, it really meant knowledge, and it was not in the current connotation of that word. Uh, it was Galileo who really set us on the path to understanding science as we know it in a contemporary sense. Uh, um, Galileo, that's well known of course, started doing experiments and in the Bazell Library you can see a representation of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and his demonstration that got us away from uh, Aristotle's view of the rate at which uh, objects fell. So da Vinci, an outstanding engineer also I think, uh, and maybe closer to, to, to being an engineer. and. Uh, as we look at uh, De La Pintura, which really talks about his work as an artist, uh, if you'll notice on the left page, uh, open to, uh, the, to those visitors, uh, there's a, a image, a well-known image attributed to Galileo, and it's uh, the Vitruvius man. So, and Vitruvius was uh, a Roman engineer, and he talked about, uh, wrote a book about architecture, and he wrote about the proportions of man. And so, you see this image of man with his arms outstretched and his legs outstretched inside of a circle, and bounded by a circle. So again, how wonderful this exhibit is and sort of uh, connecting all of these uh, different areas. And we can see in some way how uh, those enrich each other, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Galileo's knowledge of music, I think, certainly helped him with some of the scientific discoveries that he had, and particularly in the sense of time and how important time is. So I talked about the times of Galileo, but now I'm talking about time in terms of of, of a watch or the times of the heavens and certainly as he observed the times of, uh, of the movement of the bodies in the firmament, he came to appreciate, or I should say how he moved, how they moved relative to the firmament. He came to appreciate uh, the, the heliocentric nature of our solar system and then he was involved in, in other ways uh, in time. There is at the Bazell uh, Library exhibit an incline Plane. And Galileo's expertise as a musician would have enabled him to have a sense of timing that would have been on something like 1 128th of a second. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what his sense of timing enabled him to do was to determine a relationship between uh, the movement of an object down an inclined plane, I think particularly probably a sphere, and uh, its time. And so, uh, of course, and when I say a relationship, I'm talking about a mathematical relationship. And Galileo thought that the language of the universe was mathematics. And we can talk about uh, that as in a contemporary sense, too. Uh, scientists, uh, particularly physicists and engineers, they really look at the universe from the perspective of how mathematics describes it. It's another language. There's a language that exists in many, many senses. There's another cut through this gallery in terms of how to look at it uh, from my point of view, and that's uh, the language. We can look at the language of mathematics, uh, of course, in the sciences, uh, the proportions. There's uh, the Divine Proportions book by uh, Luca Pat. Uh, and there are the proportions that I mentioned earlier in da Vinci's uh, drawing of the Vitruvius, Vitruvius man. And then uh, there is, I think we can talk about the language uh, of, uh, of art as well. So can we think of, of art in an abstract way as a, a language? In this room, uh, there are uh, several representations of uh, perspective, linear perspective, uh, by Albrecht Dürer and, uh, and other images inside of the room. And so, so when we talk about art, uh, we often think of, uh, of course, a look at the objects that are uh, in that image, in that uh, visual representation. And we might say that uh, perhaps the objects are words inside of the language of art. And then how, you, how these objects relate 
uh, might be called a grammar. So perhaps the linear perspective is one grammar. Or and Da Vinci also was uh, one who proposed f uh, having objects fade as they got farther into the distance. So maybe there's another either fade in color or in the the detail and the distinction between borders. Uh, uh, something that was actually called sfumatos, a uh, technique that he used. So uh, here we've looked at these. Uh, various techniques, linear perspective, chiaroscuro, and uh, sfumato. There are these techniques that might be considered maybe the grammar of art. And here I see art in the visual images that a lot of scientists use too. Uh, now, I want to be very careful here because these aren't really necessarily fine arts, but the fine artists, the people that do fine art, really help us to perhaps see the techniques and the ways to actually represent things spatially or conceptually. Sometimes that's in an abstract way. Uh, we can look at uh, quantum chromodynamics and the uh, colors that are present inside of, of those and how uh, that helps us to see how observations were made by physicists. And also for me as a chemical engineer and I look at the structures of chemical molecules and how chemists uh, represent those. There are structures that help us to communicate uh, it is a language again. It helps us to communicate uh, what are, how we visualize these uh, molecules and then how we envision them undergoing uh, certain processes, reactions, and transformations. And there are rules that are written inside of that language. So again, there's a grammar associated with how we represent those molecules. A, a certain atom will have a certain number of electrons and bonds, and you come to learn how those are related to one another. Is there any other uh, specific book or text that you would like to talk about. I know that we uh, we both looked at this uh, one publication that dealt with uh, science, and of course it, it was natural magic as it was stated, and then the uh, the the concept of the dark room uh, and the and, and the camera and of that, and that that attracted me to ask you some questions, and I'm sure the general public that would be a, a, an interesting take uh, as far as your perspective on that. Yeah, thanks for actually mentioning that. That's uh, another very interesting object in the collection uh, that in this exhibit. And it's uh, adjacent to the uh, De La Pintura that I mentioned earlier. It's to the left of that and a very interesting uh, image. Uh, it shows, uh, talks about the camera obscura and, and also uh, camera lucida. These were devices, depending on whether it was optics or not, but you could take a dark room with a, a small hole and an image could appear and that could be used to uh, make a drawing or a replication of the real world in a, in a two-dimensional sense. So here's the sciences, the sciences of optics that kind of come into play. And for me, I became interested in this some years ago by reading an article by the a rather well-known uh, British uh, artist, uh, David Hockney, and he wrote an article in The New Yorker some years ago. And so if someone was, happens to be interested in optics in, in this particular subject area, they might track that article down. But it was his contention that many of the artists in the, I'll say, the late Renaissance and even after that, uh, used optics and a, a camera lucida or similar system to actually make the very fine detailed uh, graphic uh, drawings that they prepared. So Ang was uh, one, or Ang is, was one artist that he suggested that actually used this method. So, and that was uh, just prior, of course, to the onset of uh, photography. So very interesting to see how that device uh, really matured. There were arguments and debates that went on whether or not uh, optics were used by someone so distinguished uh, as Ang. And one argument's even pointing to a painting of one of the popes using a magnifying glass. Well, okay, so there were indeed optics and they appreciated the role of optics and how they might be used in uh, uh, looking at and, and observing the world around us. From your uh, perspective, uh, being in the college that you are in, chemical, biological, and materials engineering, in your mind, what direct links would be, uh, in your mind, from Galileo's world to your discipline today? Oh, a very interesting question. Uh, of course, much of engineering now, they even use the term engineering science. Uh, so the world has become uh, so complex and detailed that uh, very challenging questions are used. Uh, a comparison between science and engineering, uh, again, in my mind, uh, 
science is often described as the uh, field of discovery, discovering new knowledge. And so once you've seen this and you figured it out, well, okay. And, but engineers really look to use that and use that knowledge. And to me, there is art in that as well. Uh, it's, there's a creation side, a design side, where creativity then obviously comes into play. And uh, so uh, that maybe frees us up in some way. I mean, engineering science allows us to, to also uh, think about hypotheses and proving new ideas. Uh, but then how can we turn those into something that's uh, to uh, create something that is of utility, utilitarian, some util- utility to mankind? Any, uh, any parting thoughts here? Any other thoughts as far as this exhibit? Um, well, one thing I thought I might share sure. because we'll have visitors here who may not know much about uh, the history of science collection, and I think they should. Uh, this is just a wonderful uh, resource that we have at the University of Oklahoma. It has a, a very interesting history, I, I, I believe. Um, the books that you are seeing in this exhibit are from that history of science collection. And it is really uh, world famous. It is a world famous collection and we have people that come from the, certainly the east and the west coast and, and elsewhere to actually view the objects that we had here. And so I encourage our guests to, to visit and go see those. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. We have been chatting here. You've been listening to Beyond Galileo. And our guest today was uh, Dr. Ed O'Rear. And Ed, I want to thank you for coming today. And uh, this is part of a series of podcasts that uh, the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art is doing with the uh, exhibit that we have here entitled Galileo's World. So thanks, Ed, for coming. 